Farms Program, which really has a, a statewide mission to serve um, farmers um, across enterprises. My focus is in vegetable production, and within vegetables, it's in reduced tillage systems. As Joseph mentioned, um, working with Anu Rangarajan, uh, building off research and on-farm um, networking experiences, farmer to farmer workshops to, to really elevate what's working, what needs, what more research do we need and get farmers talking. So um, I feel, um, I feel um, happy to share a couple lessons learned here and, um, and uh, join in on your conversations that you've been having. And I, I don't need to harp on the, the value of tillage um, in building soil health. This is a soil health uh, uh, training. But um, my lens has always been um, on reducing tillage, but within the context of incorporating it within other practices, right? So that's rotations, cover crops, and compost uh, in organic systems. Um, how do we how do we combine reduced tillage with these other soil health bidding practices, right? And a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, I, I used to have this um, black box under the tillage uh, picture there because I really wasn't sure what it looked like in our organic operations. But clearly, it's um, it's uh, it's got a lot of different forms, and there's a lot of successful operations out there. That are finding ways to reduce tillage. So there, there are increasingly more and more examples of what reduced tillage looks like in organic systems. We're just trying to kind of jump on that and, and learn more and facilitate that uh, both with research and the farmers that are um, uh, having success sharing their stories. So we started um, a, a bunch of years ago, you put a lot of farmer, organic farmers in a room and ask them what does reduced tillage look like on your farm and it really is going to depend on the farm. Um, and a lot of it is based on scale um, and the equipment and size of the operation. And so we learned a lot about uh, farmers using permanent beds um, and on small scales, whether that's with uh, uh, or perennial pathways or using mulches and tarps, uh, controlled traffic um, and the value of beds is, is, is key or um, strip till operations or kind of targeted tillage to the in-row zone uh, takes a lot of different forms as well. So it really is going to depend on the farm and the, and primarily also the scale of the operation and the resources that, that someone has available. So I, I don't, um, uh, I'm going to, I just want to put that out there as something that we need to honor when we work with farmers based on it's going to take, it's going to take shape based on what they, where they are at their farm. Uh, but regardless of the type of farm and the scale of the operation, I think that it's uh, pretty pretty well understood that one of some of the primary barriers to reducing tillage, and I'm sure you've already talked about this when you talk about uh, electroshocking weeds, um, was how are we going to reduce tillage in organic systems and control weeds? How are we going to get our crop established? Uh, what equipment are we going to use to get it done? Um, how are we going to maintain, at least maintain yields, if not improve them? And manage residue kind of come up to the to the forefront. So um, I want to just talk about two examples. There's a, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different practices out there, but these are two practices that we have been digging into over the last five years or so. And I so I wanted to share some examples of what we've been learning when it comes to strip tillage. You know, when when you're on a farm that has the the horsepower to run a tool, um, maybe the acreage uh, to have a um, to um, to focus in on uh, a, a set of equipment that's given for a set row spacing that works for a, a dedicated crop, then um, zone tillage will, um, might be an option. When you're uh, on a smaller operation and you're having growing 50 different crops, it, it, it's a little less likely that you're willing to invest in equipment and thinking about a system that's only targeted to one or two crops. You're more likely to think about the use of permanent beds and and controlled wheel traffic so that you're always returning to the bed um, and your wheels are always in paths and you're trying to uh, concentrate tillage or, um, or minimize tillage within the bed. So really both of these systems are built off of, of a managed compaction model. I think you're not gonna reduce tillage if you don't have uh, managed compaction, whether that's zone tillage and, and alleviating compaction 
with uh, with a deep shank or um, um, or permanent beds and reducing compaction by concentrating that compaction essentially in the wheel tracks, you're not going to open yourself up for options for reducing tillage if you don't get a hold of compaction. So I'm going to dig into these two systems today. Um, the time I have, I, Joseph, I'm going to invite uh, us to have and field any questions about um, about tillage, about zone tillage, and before we get into tarping and hopefully um, break things up a little bit, we'll see how we do with that. So awesome, yeah, that sounds good. And we can and you can go five or some so minutes after the allotted time. Just all right. I will. I will started a little bit late. I don't have a good. I don't have a good track record. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do my best. Okay. So. Um, so zone tillage, I, I, uh, many of you are probably already familiar with this system, less familiar with the idea of doing this in organic systems. It's not a new concept at all, but uh, relatively um, uh, not, not well practiced in organic if um, very few examples of it. So we, we're in, in our research, we're thinking about how, what is organic uh, zone tillage or strip tillage look like? And we've been doing work in uh, winter killed spring plantings and we're basically mat matching the cover crop with the planting time for your vegetables or with a, a summer planting where you might have a winter hardy cover crop and manage that as a mulch. Both uh, in both examples uh, what we're trying to do is have this kind of tillage compromise right where we have tillage in the zone and um, residue and limited soil disturbance between uh, between the zones and see if we can get the benefits of of no-till and the benefits of tillage, which we know are there are many at the same time. Um, I think these the tools to accomplish this uh, are varied. We um, you see a lot of innovation on farms when they have the equipment uh, skills to kind of and and the and the materials in the barn to put stuff together. Essentially, uh, one common uh, aspect of these is this idea of stacking tools. So with zone tillage, you are, um, are you're trying to accomplish multiple operations at the same time, right? And that might be removing residue out of the zone, drawing the sh um, a deep subsoil or a shank to alleviate compaction in the zone, and some kind of finishing unit behind that to make the bed uh, for planting. And ideally, that happens in one pass, but not necessarily always the case. It might be a, a two-pass system, or, or it depends on the farm, but what I uh, recognize is that there are tools out there um, for folks to purchase, and then there's other uh, innovations that farmers are coming up with that work for them to basically uh, concentrate it within the slot where they're going to plant their vegetables, whether that's direct seeded, uh, large seeded crops, or transplants. So we've been focusing a lot on this idea of uh, growing a mulch with um, winter hardy cover crops, which folks are probably very familiar with. Um, the general timeline um, of this is that we plant our cover crops in mid-September. This is a cereal rye uh, mixed with a legume. Um, you you uh, terminate that crop at um, flowering in early June around here, uh, and then you plant and you and you plant uh, mid to late June and harvest in September. So this is targeting, say, a fall brassica. Um, Example, uh, but can vary for those later plantings. Not going to not going to work for every crop. Um, so some of the some of the tools that um, we've been using that that um, I want to highlight um, is this idea of a lot of a lot of attention towards rolling. Uh, we've been using a flail mower, a side mounted flail mower, to not drive over the cover crop at the same time that we're um, at same time of mowing, uh, which is an important component uh, of managing this to not to actually get effective termination with mowing. We like to mow because uh, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit addicted to flail mowing, actually. I like the fineness of it. It, it uh, provides some opportunities for, for movement of residue if we have to. Um, and that, that's usually accomplished with something like these row cleaners, whether a separate pass or, um, or with it um, on the tool. Uh, of um, tillage, but the idea is this kind of rolling motion to push stuff out of the way. And that's what it looks like when you um, try to concentrate basically this residue within the zone. Um, uh, on this rolling theme, we recognize that uh, in many, many cases, this mulch is regardless of the four to five tons uh, for um, 
acre that we grow, we still get weeds that emerge. So we're always prepared to cultivate these systems and trying to figure out the best ways to do that. We generally have used rolling tools, similar to the uh, rolling, ro um, um, this idea of row cleaners, uh, Lilliston cultivators or a gang of discs. We're prepared to uh, see weeds emerge and we, we so we don't call this a no-till system for that for that very reason. We're trying to we're trying to manage weeds. We recognize that they that um, you know we might reduce our cultivation by one, but but after 30 days or so, it's very after um, six site years of doing this, we we have always felt the need to cultivate these systems and finding the tools to do that is really important. Um, this is an example of what it looks like when you're uh, going through with one of these. Uh, so we're conserving residue um, where it's not, it's not um, intensive, but it has to do the job. Uh, a lot of, some of these are winter annuals that have already been established and there's certainly some summer annual emergence in there as well. Let's see if this video actually works. Um, on, again, on this rolling theme, our partners at Michigan State, they're doing a lot of work with cultivation tools and, and have, um, and have trialed and been using uh, finger weeders in the zone uh, with pretty good success. And so um, again, it, it's a system where we're not relying on, uh, on the mulch necessarily to control weeds. We're getting other benefit. We definitely are getting some benefit from it. We're maximizing that biomass uh, in the spring. We're adding the nitrogen in the case of the legume, but then we're finding the tools that are needed and hopefully to, to manage weeds and that operate in these higher residue environments. One strategy to, to do this, uh, to get the residue out of the way is to actually avoid the in-row uh, zone altogether. Um, some have tried this, but they basically leave that zone blank. Um, and so planning in advance, maybe uh, doing the till, it, um, we've done this by blocking the, the cedar at the time of seeding the cover crop. Others we do fall tillage in that zone or spring tillage before the cover crop really takes off basically to get it clean. Even the rye roots in this in zone are actually, in my mind, uh, the biggest hang, uh, hang up. So getting that out of the way and not dealing with those root balls is, 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 is a logistical advantage. We haven't found many benefits. We thought that maybe the, there would be benefits associated with um, some of these tools operations or, or say with, um, with uh, weed emergence, but we, we didn't actually, we haven't found much. It's more of a practical side of things that this, 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 might, uh, this might add up. Um, so we've been comparing different cover crops in this system, looking at rye with this zone unplanted, looking at rye com, uh, with uh, hairy vetch, uh, crimson clover, uh, also looking at mo monocultures of, of vetch. And um, generally what we found is that uh, we can produce a lot of biomass doing this, um, as I mentioned before. Uh, even with rye and crimson clover, we, we basically had equal biomass to winter rye and hairy vetch. Um, um, and hairy vetch, as you would expect, when you have a monoculture of hairy vetch, you have about half uh, in, you know, in a, a, a good soil. You might have, uh, in the case of um, our Howard Gravel in New York, about one and a half to two tons versus four tons with this, uh, um, with the cereal legume combination, but certainly um, a, a, a tremendous amount of nitrogen uh, when we have a, a hairy vetch uh, cover crop. And, and so we've been, uh, one of our questions was whether or not we um, could kind of build off of this idea of strip planting to the strip zone and see what the, if there are any advantages or benefits to putting the, the legume in the zone, kind of like you would concentrate your fertilizer in the zone maybe get some of the um, this uh, rye residue out of the way. Um, but essentially um, in all of our work, we, we found that this is, there, there was very little benefit when it came to weed management, when it came to nitrogen availability, or when it came to biomass, these, these two systems were, were pretty much equivalent. Um, I wanted to provide a picture of, uh, of, of a different soil, right? I don't, I think soil is really important as far as what you're going to get when it comes to the balance between legume and rye. And this is the case in a sandy loam in Michigan, or certainly um, the, in, a, in a sandy soil, the legume is, is more favored uh, with those in a low end environment. 
Um, even so, um, they found that all these results around strip planting um, and um, and uh, rye and vetch versus rye and crimson clover have been the same. You get equal amounts of biomass in rye and crimson clover than you do in vetch across these different soil types, um, even with uh, these differences in um, and even with these differences in the proportions of legume and rye. We've also done a little bit. We're started with uh, Austrian winter pea and have good success there. So there's not a tremendous amount of legumes to choose from, but uh, we, um, um, I, I would be encouraged to do some more work with winter pea. One of the biggest take homes associated with this work is that the biggest driver of yields is the available N um, in cabbage um, provided by the, by the cover crop. And that, um, that yield is uh, directly related to the seed N ratio of the cover crop. And so um, we, in this case, crimson clover was underperforming. We found the uh, C to N ratio of that mixture um, to be higher and to directly result in lower yields. And uh, vetch, rye and vetch uh, performed better. And in some years, vetch alone uh, exceeded both of those mixtures, but not in all years. And um, in almost all years, this kind of rye vetch or vetch monoculture performed as well as planting rye and adding 120 pounds of nitrogen uh, to try to, to substitute for that. So uh, this is, there's a tremendous amount of N, even in strip-till systems that the legume can provide um, to a high demanding crop like cabbage. Not a lot of uh, folks are willing to take on this level of biomass. I, I understand that very well. It can be intimidating. So um, one direction that we have been looking at is this idea of alternative management strategies for the, the mixtures. Uh, perhaps that's a, a repeated mowing and shallow tillage operation. Uh, what on a small scale, that's a rototill. On a large scale, that might be a speed disc or potentially removing that biomass in a kind of cut and carry approach uh, using that biomass either as feed or as a mulch somewhere else on the farm. And we've been comparing and compare that to the mulch system. And generally we found pretty good success. Um, we had saw a slight yield hit with the cut and carry as you would expect, because you're taking a lot of that N off of, off of the field. Uh, but these are alternative options that, um, that I, I think that we can explore more when it comes to winter hardy cover crops getting a lot of biomass, um, but um, maybe not inheriting as much residue to, to, um, to um, get, in, get in the way. A couple of uh, take homes um, or thoughts from my perspective about planning for this and working with farmers to do this is always to target large seeded vegetables or transplants first. Um, start, um, start with crops on wide spacing like cucurbits you find that that edge between the cover crop and the zone is an important and somewhat difficult um, area to maintain. Uh, and so the less edge you have between the tilled and the untilled zone, probably the, the better um, you are to start out. The importance of legumes in here, especially for a crop like cabbage or other crops that, that are high in demanding and for reducing and vetch and winter pea uh, have certainly outperformed crimson clover and the importance of rolling, rolling tools for high residue, whether that's the row cleaners, rolling cultivators, um, seem to be the direction to go. So with that, I'm going to stop and take a pause and see if there's any questions. Here. Okay, Sounds good. Folks, feel free to unmute yourself, uh, raise your hand, put something in the chat. Um, if you want me to ask the question for you. But really, really great pictures you got, Ryan. Nice, nice visually appealing presentation. I'm enjoying it. All right. All right. This well, is... I got plenty to talk about tarps, so uh, we don't have to. We don't. Looks have to... looks like Paul's got a question. Okay. Yeah, Ryan. I'm sorry. Um, those tillage tools, love them. Um, the uh, the zone tills, it looked like they were, uh, I'll say, homemade or fabricated, self self fabricated, pioneered. Are there are there ones for sale on the market that are commercially available, or were those pretty much, you know, fabricated on farm for your specific needs? 
Uh, a lot of those were fabricated by farmers to, to, for their uh, needs. We have done a little bit of fabrication using the yeoman's plow um, and some finishing units because we were interested in something that required a little less horsepower, but there certainly are tools out there that are available that you can purchase ready to go. Um, we use a, a unreferred deep zone builder in a lot of our trials and you know I, I know a lot of uh, larger vegetable farms in New York have used similar types of tools multiple 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 row there's there are um, there are uh, Hineker is another name that comes to mind um, uh, getter makes tools so they're, they're certainly there and and um, you can move it uh, from one row up to 12 you know excellent thank you very much appreciate it um, Jennifer do you want to ask your question Yes, thank you. Just curious, when you went back your slide where you had, um, I think it was crimson clover and winter rye in strips and then just mixed, you said you didn't find any differences because we have talked about possibly for compaction, putting the daikon radishes under the tire well and like we've played with the tools of stripping that. So you didn't find any difference within how much nitrogen or biomass or anything. We didn't find any differences when it came to these cover crops. We didn't look at the combination of, of, of something like radish in, in, this, uh, in this example. You know, it could be that you could put a winter killed cover crop in the zone and have rye in between the zone. One, in one year, that was kind of a risky strategy to leave the zone bare. Um, and so uh, as far from weeds perspective, things winter annuals kind of took off and got too big before, and the zone till unit didn't really work that um, to kill them. You know. So having a winter kill cover crop in there like radish in the zone in the planting area, um, there's the timing and the logistics around planting are more complicated, I guess, but, um, but it's an interesting strategy, interesting idea. We didn't look at it from the radish. We tried radish compared to oats in the, for early vegetables and we had really good um, success with weed suppression in that combination. Um, and then, oops, sorry. Well, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> And then Jacob had a question about, um, and maybe I'll expand it a little bit. Um, do you have any growers that are integrating animals into into a reduced till with all the, figuring out how to do what to do with all the biomass? Um, that's a great question. My mind freezes up when I think about animals. Um, I'm a plant guy, uh, I guess, <laughs> but um, I don't have. Uh, now there's one there's one grower who 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 had had used some of this to to feed animals, but I have heard more with the cut and carry about this idea of trying to use it as a mulch. We worked with the with the grower that's doing that. Um, it takes a lot of labor to move that around, um, but say take it from the field and put it in a high tunnel. Those kinds of examples. Uh, I'm sure there are some out there that I, I just haven't been connected with because uh, it just depends on the grower. They have the animals there. All right, I think that was it. All right, how am I doing on time? Um, you got, I think let's say you have 20 more minutes left, including time for Q&A at the end. Great. Um, so uh, I wanna switch gears and talk more on small scales. And when I talk small um, and I talk tarps, I think it's, it's most common that uh, a tarper is farming uh, five acres or less, uh, although larger farms that, um, that are in diversified vegetables are finding ways to use tarps uh, in a particular um, subset of their operation, whether that's targeting uh, one field, direct seeded crops, or even high tunnels. So it is a human scale, um, human labor at this point um, uh, uh, approach. And so it, it's, very, it's very much a, um, a smaller, oper uh, a, a smaller operation, uh, geared towards smaller operations, I should say. So what does a tarp look like? You guys might, um, these have really gained popularity in the last uh, five or more years with um, uh, uh, really inspired by this book by Jean Mont, 1348 and the Margaret Gardner, but a lot of books um, and a lot of small scale organic no-till are, are um, practices on farms are using tarps in some way. Um, they are generally uh, durable, five, six mil plastic, sourced as silage tarps, not always. Um, 
impermeable, not always. Um, I, I'm learning more and more that folks are using, uh, some folks are using woven um, uh, materials basically to manage water. And, but a lot, I'd say most are using silage, uh, plastic, um, black side up, I should say, that is um, um, durable applied between plantings. So this idea is that we're not planting into this material, we're using them between plantings. So you need a, you define uh, windows in your, in your rotation that uh, where these are serving as kind of bed preparation, bed holders, placeholders uh, prior to planting and then they're removed and they're either um, in a, in a well-run tarping uh, uh, example, they're rotated to another, uh, another part of the field. Maybe they're just pulled back over time, exposing one bed at a time for uh, succession plantings. But they're certainly reused, and we've been using uh, the same tarps for the last eight years. So um, um, those that are opposed to plastic are more willing to use a material like this that has a bit of more of a lifespan. So uh, tarping and um, tillage takes uh, many different forms, um, and really you just start doing it and learn how their bed prep is when using tarps. Some are using pretty um, standard tillage tools and then tarping for several weeks and, and holding those beds, hoping to germinate some weeds, uh, uh, create this kind of stale seed bed, talk more about that, and then pulling them off and ready to plant. This might mean that they're preparing a whole field, but they're at one time, but they're uh, only planting um, in some kind of sequence. So the tarps are giving them the opportunity to hold those beds with just that one tillage tool, regardless of if it's a conventional tool and reduce the number of passes that they need. Say they could plant there three weeks later, pull it off and inherit the, the ground just as they left it. It's really a preservation tool. Um, some are going shallower, you know, uh, we've been trying to go shallower. How shallow can you go? Uh, certainly, um, in this case, we deal with a lot of chickweed, a lot of winter annuals in, in spring. Um, we're, we're going shallower and, um, and setting our tools as shallow as we can go, but asking tarps to take care of the rest. So we're not killing all of these weeds, but we're asking the, weed, the tarps to do that for us um, and basically do some incorporation, set things back, get some residue out of the way. Um, others are going all, all no-till, basically, and putting tarps over beds like this that um, basically have all these emerged weeds and killing, and killing weeds um, using tarps and planting in them. So there's a lot of different examples. I, I'll put a plug out there for um, a recent series that I want to direct you to where we focused on six farmers across the Northeast that are using tarps with dramatically different practices. And so that's available on the YouTube, um, uh, YouTube channel for Cornell Small Farms and direct your farmers or yourself to those to learn more about what tarps are actually looking like on farms. So a um, lot of different, lot of different approaches. Uh, focusing more on this multifunctionality, it is a soil building and RT approach, but there's there appears to be a lot of other elements to it. Uh, one that I wanted to point out here is this idea of allowing early spring field access, which we kind of also already think about with some RT strategies, but this idea that growers are preparing their beds in fall, especially in poorly drained or in, in fields that they, get, they want to get in early. They're work over the fall and tarping to hold those. Beds. So basically these tarps are coming off first, first probably like right now and, and they're planting, uh, inheriting the conditions that they left, right? And so as they basically shed water. So if on, on those poorly drained uh, soils, it's allowing them more access. But all kinds of things, holding weeds, uh, uh, beds weed free, stale seed bedding, um, trying to um, um, decompose residue. There's a lot of different functions that folks are after. And I would say that they are not, um, they're a multifunctional tool with a lot of logistical challenges. Um, they face this idea that they're a mess and, and they're impermeable and they're plastic and you have to move them around. They hold water. Uh, the logistics of holding them down, the sandbags or anything you have on the farm and those things not getting in the way of other operations and doing this um, as efficiently as possible so that it makes sense. Generally, uh, folks are willing, most are willing to take these logistical challenges on because of the benefits associated with till, uh, reducing tillage and controlling weeds. But they are not short of challenges. 
Okay, um, this is one of the challenges, right? So you got this, uh, we're trying to figure out what is going on underneath of these, um, what, what's changing under the soils. Um, we have a very shallow understanding of that right now. We're trying to build on that. This, um, so what's happening under here? You, you do tillage or you don't do tillage, you put this down, maybe you have it on over winter. What do you expect? Um, one thing is that you're, um, you would expect you're raising soil temperatures. And certainly we are raising soil temperatures. One thing that we have found is that on average, we're raising temperatures about four degrees, right? So we're not seeing like these tremendous spikes like you see with solarizing and clear plastic. It's, it's more, it's a more moderate increase, right? And, and this is, this data comes from the middle of the summer. So early June uh, or late June, early July. To give an example of how we're not reaching these tremendous peaks compared to bare ground, right? We're actually making a bigger difference on the minimum temperatures than we are on the maximum temperatures. So it's like this little buffering at best, but it's not, yes, we're raising temperatures, which could have a lot of effects on microbial community and biological activity, but we're not spiking temperatures as we would maybe think. Uh, we're also changing the nitrogen dynamics for sure, especially when we're tarping over winter. When we say tarp in November and we pull off in, um, in mid-May in this kind of 10 plus week uh, scenario, you can see this dramatic bump in soil nitrate. And that's probably related to two processes. One, the absence of leaching because water is not moving through impermeable tarps. And two, we're warming soil temperatures particularly this time of year or um, starting this time of year into May when that really starts to happen to kind of get our uh, microbial activity pumping. So there's kind of two, two processes at least uh, um, going on there. But we see that kind of bump even in a three week time period, uh, whether that's in spring or in, uh, in, in uh, early spring in June or in actually even in, um, in July, we get that, uh, that bump. So there's all these different uh, windows to, that we can potentially put tarps in. You got to find those windows, and but it's universal that putting them on uh, makes more available more N available at the time of planting. Does that mean that the crop responds and uh, it takes advantage of it? Because we always think about, you know, well, it's not really the time. I just planted my cabbage. I'm going to need that four weeks from now. I guess we don't really have a great answer, but. Um, if you get a big gully washer, um, maybe that's less the case. But uh, we need to do more work to understand, you know, do we need to adjust some nitrogen recommendation, recommendations based on use of tarps? One shortcoming of tarps that we have come across is this idea of managing residue. This is when you put a tarp over um, a winter uh, killed oak um, cover crop and um, hope that it helps kind of degrade that residue when we've kind of found that it's more of a preservation tool, in, at least in this example, where we just put it directly over, there's no incorporation in the soil, there's no soil to residue contact. Um, so it, they have definitely come up short in some cases when it comes to decomposing residue, it just means we need to be prepared. In the case of zone tillage, like I was saying, mowing this, mowing it and then getting out of the way is one, so is one option. So in this case, I would probably mow that fall cover crop of oats in spring, or sorry, in uh, late fall, and then prepare to rake it in, sp in spring. And then I'd be able to run this little jang cedar through it and it would be fine, but I, I wouldn't rely on the tarp to get the job done. Same case for broccoli stalks. I mean, how much can you ask of a, of a tarp to decompose a, a, a broccoli stalk? Not much, just means that you need to put the time in to pull those stalks out of the way before you run those through. We have found, um, other benefits um, associated with um, soils as we measure crop stands, and this is pretty interesting. I think it has mostly to, uh, to do with this kind of mellowing of the soil and kind of a slight conservation of moisture underneath of the tarp. Tarps generally hold moisture um, compared to these kinds of their, their more level moisture. Basically the moisture that you have that you apply when you apply is the moisture you can expect when you take it off. Whereas these dry uh, fluctuations that you would find in untarped ground, and in the in the soil, we we found to get a little bit better soil seed to contact with this kind of with a tarp that kind of mellows the soil compared to say a shallow tillage with a rototiller. So we found about uh, any uh, over fifty percent greater stands in this case of beets 
by just applying a tarp. Um, I, I want to um, come back to this idea of stale seed bedding. Uh, this is one of the primary processes that folks think about with a tarp. You prepare your ground, you have some moisture, you have some heat, you put this tarp down, and these white thread weeds start to germinate. Regardless of the fact that there's no light, they germinate, and the absence of light, they then die. So then you take these tarps off, and then you're inheriting less weeds for the crop. So we've done some uh, work to try to quantify this, whether it's with deep tillage or shallow tillage, and certainly have found this benefit, stale seed bed benefit from you know, up to 83% decline in, um, in weeds. Doesn't work, I, I think we need to do more on understanding the types of weeds that are affected here. And, and I think some have found some problem weeds um, that, that aren't affected um, and it's gonna depend on the farm. Um, this is an example of some of one of our long-term trials. On the right, we've been doing no-till with the tarp. Um, on the left, we've been doing uh, conventional tillage without a tarp for the last uh, seven years. And this is the kind of weed seed bank that we have, uh, that we have produced in a conventionally tilled system um, compared to a no-till system with a tarp. And this isn't just directly related to a tarp and that still fatal germination, but I think it also has to do with us being on top of weeds that go to seed, which was mentioned earlier, right? So tarps are going down at times of year when, um, say that time when gallon soga is starting to, to make seed and they're keeping some of those uh, mature plants from, they're killing them before they go to seed or they're holding beds, they're holding chickweed from going to seed because they've been on early, uh, early in the spring before we can get into the field. And so using tarps with timely tarping, we've been able to reduce the seed bank, both through German, uh, um, and also both through fatal germination and uh, timely tarping. And I, I would also think that an important component is that we don't let weeds go to seed in this new fall system. Basically, if, if we have an escape, we pull it. And so that's an important component. Um, this is an example of tarps. <laughs> if you just were to apply them and kind of walk away from the field, um, it's going to depend on the seed bank that you have in your soil. How much can you ask of a tarp? This is after a really poorly uh, managed uh, experiment that I am uh, responsible for um, and where we tarped in, in the following year and just let them go. And so these are um, uh, six foot tall pigweeds um, that, that came up, right? So yes, we can have an effect uh, on weed seed bank, but, it's, but you have to put it in the context of all the weeds that you have in your seed bank. And um, in many cases, we are have supplemental weed, hand weeding, targeted hand weeding to get the job done. So it's not just tarps alone. We have certainly come up short when it comes to uh, perennial weeds. A lot of folks think about putting tarps on to kill them. Uh, I think it would take a long time to do it. Um, um, more than three, four weeks, no doubt. Uh, greater than six weeks. Some people try it all season long. I think this is quack grass, this is yellow nuts edge. I think in, in the case of tarping, it might be some combination of tillage and tarping that would help to get these perennials under control. In our case, we have, um, we have hammered these perennial weeds when we needed to. And I would suggest nobody start to do a no-till or even reduced till system until perennial weeds are, are actually under control. Um, um, one last comment. Uh, that kind of gets back to this initial point of stacking tarps with other practices. I haven't talked about how to stack tarps with cover crops, and really, I think there's a lot of work to be done here. But we've been um, and there's we've been doing this a little bit of this work. There's farmers doing this, and there's others in the Northeast that are killing um, cover crops, say winter hardy cover crops like rye, um, and doing it when they want to. Okay, so you can use tarps to kill. Um, winter rye in spring and not rely on um, that June planting date or that anthesis, right? So we can do it in spring. So it opens up some opportunities. We've been able to kill rye within three weeks um, in late April into early May. And you can, so you can have a May 15th planting with, um, with a rye cover crop. Uh, I, should, I should mention that we've been comparing different materials. I think the, this opportunity of landscape fabric can you get similar benefits with landscape fabric uh, compared to tarps? Um, one advantage of landscape fabric or woven fabric is that it is slightly permeable, so you don't have that mess of water, the heaviness, the logistical challenges. 
farmers are using it but it takes a little bit more time, not that much more time to kill rye, but it certainly takes a little bit more time. And we don't really actually understand all the other dynamics um, when it comes to nitrogen and, and, and temperatures and microbial, but I gen, microbial activity, but I generally think of it as kind of intermediate um, or not as, ex, not as extreme as TARP, um, but, um, but certainly still has a place. Uh, just an example from a farmer that we work with that is using this gives an example of how tarps can take lots of different sizes. Some are cutting tarps to fit the bed, um, and uh, some are applying them across an entire field. Uh, they could be uh, free, uh, they could be in this case probably six feet by uh, uh, 100 feet long, 50 feet long. They could be 40 feet wide by 100 feet long, right? Um, so there's a lot of different applications sizes, this is going over rye in, in order to plant tomatoes, right? And so uh, a farmer that had previously not been using cover crops in their rotation, in the, but because didn't know how to kill it, right? And But now is using it and finding a place for cover crops uh, by using the tarps to handle it. Um, so thinking about tarps and planting, um, think about it as taking many different forms. It doesn't have to be no-till. There's a lot of other ways that tarps can help reduce tillage by going shallower, fewer passes, just using gentler tools that we need to find and really planning for different tarp application windows. It's like you have your crop plan and then you have your tarps where they fit in, okay? So overwinter for early crops, three plus weeks for in the season and longer for perennial weeds certainly to match up and the soil conditions before and after this example of, well, um, do, am I going to do direct seeded or am I going to do um, transplants? If I'm doing transplants, I can handle some of that residue. If I'm doing direct seeded, I, I, I'm either going to plan to, to inherit to a crop in advance uh, that doesn't have, leave the residue behind, or I'm going to have a plan in, in the spring before I plant to get that residue out of the way. Um, do as much bed prep as possible before tarping. So creating the stale seed bed only works if when you pull off the tarp, you don't bring up new wheat seeds to the soil surface, right? And so you do all your work as much as possible up front, put the tarp down, pull it off, and you're ready to go. And certainly we, um, we, uh, tarps, we recognize tarps are pieces of plastic and they are not adding organic matter in themselves. They are helping us reduce tillage. So how do we combine them with cover crops and mulch to get both of those on the menu? That's all I have. Um, and I hope there's a couple minutes for questions. Um, and I invite you all to um, stay in touch or get in touch with me through uh, Cornell Small Farms checkout uh, website. And um, uh, all of this work is basically a combination of uh, small farms with the University of Maine working with out in the Northeast and also partnering with Michigan State. So I want to acknowledge all of their contributions. Awesome, thank you, Ryan, for an awesome presentation. We had one or two people who were interested in the same thing. You kind of spoke to it a little bit about the temperature increases about tarping, but wondering about the difference, if you could speak more to the difference between tarping and solar solarization with, with clear plastic. Clear plastic will give you higher, uh, will clearly give you higher temperatures. I think folks are using clear plastic in some cases, particularly in the, in the, in the middle of the summer. Um, you can get things done um, faster, probably. Uh, one thing that I think is really important with clear plastic is that the edges are sealed um, tightly. There's a little less room for air there. And so um, you don't want to create a greenhouse that just promotes weeds, right? So you basically re really rely on sealing those edges. And tarps are a little bit different in that they, uh, there's a little bit more room. Well, because we're relying on the tarp to not only germinate the weeds, but to but to block light that clear plastic does not. I think there's a little bit more flexibility with it, but definitely clear plastic has, has a role. And um, there's been the most work on that out of the University of Maine um, and uh, Sonia Brothesel. And there's, there's a couple of resources online that she's provided through eOrganic and otherwise that have looked at temperatures reached, uh, effects on microbes, comparing them. Um, so check out Sonia's, Sonia's work there. And, and also at the University of New Hampshire, um, some work looking at tarps uh, versus clear plastic to control winter rye. And definitely found that tarps have, um, or both tarps and clear plastic can kill uh, that winter rye, clear plastic faster, but they found more weeds in, um, in clear plastic than they did in tarps. 
inherited into a, a fall brassica crop. So there's a, a lot of interesting, uh, uh, I think uh, more, more and more work um, on tarps now to kind of try to catch up to how it compares and doesn't compare to solarization, which, which has been around a long time. 